I just want to find 11,780 votes. The Fulton County Grand Jury investigation of Donald Trump. What proves fact A, fact B, and fact C? If we can do that, I'm going to bring an indictment. I'm Bill Rankin. I'm Tamar Hallerman. Join us for Season 9 of Breakdown from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Listen now, and please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Today on CityCast Denver. The man who controls 85% of the global mozzarella cheese market lives in Denver, somewhere. He's a reclusive billionaire who hasn't been photographed in public since 1987. But a new lawsuit from within his own family has forced him and all his cheesy dealings into the spotlight. Our resident pizza freak, producer Paul Caroli, got the scoop on the Laprina Foods family saga from reporter Helen X, who was in the courtroom for Westward. Today is Thursday, December 15th, 2022. I'm Bree Davies, and this is CityCast Denver. Helen X, welcome to CityCast Denver. Thank you. So Helen, we have to start with the man at the center of this whole story. Who is James Laprino? Yeah, so James Laprino is this fascinating character in Denver, and I I really feel like most people have never heard of him. Maybe they've heard of Laprino Foods, but they probably don't know anything about the family behind it. But James Laprino, he is the son of immigrants, and he is the son of immigrants who started a small Italian grocery store in Denver's Little Italy. He kind of grew up in the grocery store business. Uh, there was some cheese making happening in the grocery store, but it was very much more like a deli and kind of serving a lot of cold cuts and pantry items. And when it ended up having to fold because a larger grocery chain was moving into town, he had already started to get the idea of cheese being a moneymaker. He was looking around and all these pizzerias were popping up. He was noticing how popular pizza was with the neighborhood kids. And so in 1958, he started the Prino Foods Company with, I think, Forbes reported $615 in his pocket. So so a really American dream story. Wow. So with almost nothing, you know, just being scrappy and entrepreneurial, he has a very good business sense. You know, he's been able to grow Laprino Foods into a multi-billion dollar company that today provides 85% of the world's pizza cheese. He's the exclusive provider to Pizza Hut, Domino's, Papa John's. His cheese is on a ton of frozen meals like Stouffer's and Marie Callender meals. And there's a very, very high chance that you have consumed a lot of Laprino food cheese mozzarella and you've just never known about it. And it's a private company headquartered in Denver. It's still family owned. Um, And so... It's it's this crazy American dream story of a son of immigrants rising to be, you know, one of the top billionaires in America. It really is an incredible story. I love the um, the photo in one of your pieces for Westward, the black and white photo. I think it's of uh, James's father standing in the uh, the little corner market on 38th Avenue. And it's like this guy took this small corner store like a tiny little grocery store and grew it into this global cheese empire. I love it. It is incredible. It is incredible. And no one knows about it. Why don't we know about it? Why don't, why aren't we celebrating this story? They're extremely private. They're a private company. So that already allows them a bit of a shield from the public, right? They don't have to report out on financials. They don't have thousands of shareholders. They don't have huge investor firms bugging them about their finances and performance. And then I think personally, the family has just been very private. There's Before this trial started, there was only one publicly available photo of James G. From 1987. Yes. He's, I think he's like 38 or something. I I forget how old he is in that (laughs) photo, but it's been a long time. And there's only one interview with him on record, which is this 2017 Forbes article. And I have no idea how they convinced him to do it. I think even in the article, he's quoted saying something like, I can't believe I agreed to this. I I don't want to do this. (laughs) So just they're just a very private company, uh, private family. And because they're a private company, the world has allowed them to be private. Mm hmm. Um, so before we get into the trial, which has really given us our, our first proper look into the company and into the family dynamics behind it, can you just explain 
How, how did he corner the market on this specific type of low quality, low cost mozzarella cheese from Denver? I think it's a combination of in the beginning, he was willing to serve that low cost market, right? So the same year mm-hmm. he founded Leprino Foods, that's when Pizza Hut was founded. I think Little Caesars was started a, maybe a year afterwards. Domino started delivering pizza around that time. So he was in at the right time at the very beginning. And what all those chains needed at that moment was low cost, reliable mozzarella cheese. Cheese is one of the biggest cost drivers of a pizza. He was able to step into that space and provide them something that's consistent, that's reliable, and also low cost. And the way he was able to do that is really leveraging a lot of technology, right? Like he was not one of these artisan crafters of mozzarella cheese from the old world. He didn't really care about that history and culture. He was like, give me all the additives, give me all the chemicals. You know, he, (laughs) he hired a lot of food scientists and, and engineers to really figure out how to make a consistent product that tasted good enough, but more importantly, just was consistent and reliable. I don't think they've ever had a recall. Up to today, Leprino Foods has never had a recall for cheese, which cheese is a very, very bacteria vulnerable product. So that's kind of an amazing success story in itself. Uh, And then he was able to leverage a lot of his He's a great businessman from what I'm reading is that he was able to really develop these personal relationships with all these huge pizza pizza chains. You know, there's a paragraph in this Forbes article that says when Domino's entered into an exclusive supplier relationship with Leprino, it was a one page contract. Can you even imagine these days? Right. It was very much like a trust. Domino's. Yes. And wow. Admittedly, you know, this is back in the 80s and, and 70s. Business was done a little bit more old boys club, but he was able to establish these great relationships. He was able to constantly deliver. He was able to constantly evolve the technology of his cheese making to serve their needs best. Uh, so, you know, there's a, he has 50 patents or something like that. There's just a ton of stuff that they've done in the food science of developing cheese. They reduce the aging process to four hours. So they can take milk in to the factory and then produce mozzarella cheese in less than four hours. All of that combined with as he got more and more successful, he invested in a lot of expansion. So they have a 100-acre factory in Greeley, Colorado. And at that scale, that means that you can produce so much more at low cost, meaning you can capture such a bigger margin, offer the lower prices to your customers. And so I think all of these factors is just kind of contributed to him like dominating the pizza cheese market. So we knew he was very successful. We knew this was a private company and we knew he was very reclusive, but we didn't really know very much about the inner workings of the company or or the family. This is still a family company at the end of the day. Um, until this trial that happened earlier this week, the whole Leprino family was fighting over over his fortune, over his company. Can you Can you explain why the Leprino family was in court this month? Yeah, so... This goes back to 1965. So Leprino Foods was founded in 1958. So this is about seven years afterwards. And Jim Leprino had his cheese company and his older brother, Michael Jr. Leprino, was an independently successful businessman. He was in commercial real estate. He was in banking. And the story that I have been told by the lawyers is that their parents sat them down And they were honestly concerned about Jim and his prospects, right? Like, you run a cheese company, it's going okay, but we're very, we're concerned about your financial stability and prospects. And so they asked the two brothers to exchange 25% of each other's business with each other. And, And very much kind of, in my feeling, it's a very old Italian, you know, you take care of the family. And so, and that deal obviously ended up benefiting Michael Jr.'s family a lot more than it benefited Jim Leprino's family because G- Leprino Foods went on to become a multi-billion dollar company. Michael Jr. was very successful, but not to the level of billions of dollars, you know, <laughs> supplying 85% of the world's pizza cheese. And so there's always been this kind of split in ownership at the company. Majority shareholders are Jim Leprino, and then eventually he sold a lot of his shares to his two daughters. 
And then Michael Seniors, uh, sorry, Michael Jr.'s side of the family, same thing happened. He owns 25% and eventually sold it into trust or passed it into trust for his three daughters. Jim's side of the family is very active in the business. Uh, the two daughters hold active positions in the company. Jim's made it no secret that he wants them to succeed him. He wants them to take over the company. And on the other side, it's a little bit more passive. The, they don't hold active positions in the company. They have independent careers or independent lives. And so that's kind of the setup for the the food fight, I guess. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by the How to Buy a Home podcast. Because for the first time in five years, there's a house in my neighborhood for sale for $300,000. That's nuts. And that's just a sneak preview of 2023, which could be the year of the first time home buyer. A lot of people are predicting a recession, and that could mean buyers have more power, less cutthroat competition, and more homes on the market that could get more affordable. If you haven't listened to the How to Buy a Home podcast, now is the perfect time. Host David Sidoni is an industry expert who has helped thousands of people just like you all over North America buy their first homes. Since 2005, David has been the undisputed first time home buyer authority. His How to Buy a Home podcast has helped so many listeners close on houses they thought were impossible, even as things went nuts in the past couple of years. Start planning this holiday season at howtobuyahome.com and make this the last year you rent. Find How to Buy a Home on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. So tell me tell me about the case itself, Helen. What are these nieces suing Luprino over? If I was to ask the lawyers, they would say this case is about a breach in fiduciary duty. And there was two breaches that they alleged Probably the most people paid attention to and was a big focus of the trial was in 2017, Jim and the majority shareholders voted to convert the company from an S corporation to a C corporation. Now, only the majority shareholders voted on that. And what what happens when you do a conversion is that all of the profits that were made under the S corporation are required to be distributed to the shareholders. So in this case, Jim and his family got $405 million and then his nieces got $90 million, a ton of money. But almost three days after that $405 million hit the uh, Jim Laprino's family's bank account, they turned around and they loaned it back to the company for 2.68% interest. And so they're able to make now a yearly cash flow off of this one-time disbursement that they loan back, they're able to make millions and millions of dollars of cash flow every single year, where the nieces got their one-time $90 million payout, and they did not get the opportunity to loan it back to the company. And the company has made it part of their bylines that they do not give dividends to their shareholders. So in a way, this $90 million payout is kind of the last payout these nieces will ever see, theoretically. Hmm. And they are upset about that. I'm they guessing. are upset. They are upset that they that ninety million dollar payout was the last payout that they'll ever see, and that they'll never be able to get consistent cash flow from their twenty five percent ownership of the Laprino Foods Company again. And they didn't get the hmm. opportunity to vote. They didn't get the opportunity to be informed. They basically say they got the disbursement, and that was like goodbye, end of story. Hmm. I see. But Helen, I, I have to say, you quoted one of the lawyers as saying several times, this isn't about the money. If that's true, what was the trial about? That was the plaintiff's argument. They very much characterized the nieces as wanting to be accepted back and a part, an active part of the company again. They wanted to be able to attend shareholder meetings. They wanted shareholder meetings to be held and they wanted to be invited. They wanted a voice in major business decisions. They wanted to be involved and have some control over the ownership that they have of the company. And so I think that's where his uh, his quote comes from of, it's not about the money, it's not about the money. But I mean, at the end of the day, they were asking for almost a billion dollars. So I feel like it was a little bit about the money. <laughs> 
a little bit about the money. It's about the family coming together, but a tiny bit about the billion dollars. Yeah. yeah. I think you have to understand, I think this case has been going on for two and a half years. I think the emotional confrontation part of it is long over. They, at this point, are, they do a good job of avoiding each other. You know, it's in a courtroom, it's very much like a wedding. You have a groom side and a bride side and a courtroom, you have a plaintiff side and a defense side. And they just stay to their corners. They don't make eye contact when they have to pass each other in the hallways. It's a very, you know, studied, like, I'm not looking at you and I'm not going to cause drama. There was no scenes. There was nothing like that. Just kind of a cold awkwardness, I think, between the two sides of the family. Hmm. So how did the trial play out in the end? So the the jury ruled in favor of the defendants, so in favor of Laprino Foods Company, Jim Laprino, and his immediate family. And it, they did not award the nieces any amount of settlement. They were asking anywhere from six hundred to nine hundred million dollars, and that would have been the responsibility of the jury to decide how much. Hmm. Well, Helen, now that the trial is settled, I assume Mr. Laprino will go back to wherever it is he does whatever he wherever he lives wherever he goes he's 84 years old he's not going to be able to run this company forever is there any reason to think that denver will at some point lose its place as the capital of low cost low quality pizza cheese i honestly don't think so he set up this company to be successful for at least another generation if not more all of the infrastructure that they've built is going to last you know for the next generation or two and a lot of their scientific breakthroughs and food science breakthroughs, I mean, that's really become their their unique value proposition and that's not going away anytime soon. I honestly think we'll see his grandchildren, you know, in the same position dominating the pizza cheese market. Maybe they'll increase from 85% to 100%. There's been a lot of churn in the in the cheese industry lately and I think they're fully set up. Well, Helen X, thanks so much for joining me on CityCast Denver. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was awesome to talk about. And here's what else Denverites are talking about. RTD cutting service again. According to Nine News, the metro area's transit provider is completely shutting down the C and F light rail lines, which brought riders from Littleton and Lone Tree into downtown. RTD says the discontinuation of these routes was part of their larger plan to address ridership changes and improve reliability of other lines. And in other news, poop. As in, there's too many hikers doing their business in the backcountry and leaving it all behind. With so many people enjoying Colorado's amazing public lands, there's a new urgency around keeping tourism sustainable. The Colorado Sun says outdoor recreation groups are now handing out, quote, poop disposal kits to hopefully cut the crap. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell the mysterious James Laprino about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Denver, by texting Denver to 66866. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you later. Our resident pizza freak, producer Paul Caroli, got the scoop on the Laprino family foods. Fo- 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 I knew that was going to happen. Family foods. Family foods. <laughs>